Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's panel, which will discuss business as a force for good, and will be moderated by um, Ms. Martha Goldberg Aronson, class of 1989. So it is our pleasure to welcome her and our two other panelists back to campus this afternoon. Um, at Wellesley, Ms. Goldberg Aronson was named an All-American in Division III tennis, um, and after graduating magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa with an economics degree. She later pursued a master's in business administration at Harvard Business School. From there, she worked with Medtronic for 18 years, um, a global he healthcare solutions company, during which time she held numerous management positions, both stateside and in Switzerland. Uh, following her time at Medtronic, Ms. Goldberg Aronson acted as North American Senior Vice President and President at Hellrom Holdings Incorporated and Executive Vice President and President of Global Healthcare at Ecolab. In 2009, she received the Woman in Business Industry Leader Award from the Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal and in 2014 was named one of the 35 most influential women in healthcare in Minnesota. Ms. Goldberg Aronson currently serves on the Board of Directors of Cardiovascular Systems Incorporated, Method Electronics, and ConMed Corporation, and she was named one of Minnesota's Outstanding Corporate Directors for 2016. If you've been paying attention, she lives in Minneapolis with her, son, with her husband, Dan, and their three sons, um, where she is also chair of the board of the Guthrie Theater in the city. She's an avid water skier and stand-up paddleboarder, and I quote, working to master wake surfing. Um, <laughs> she's also a member of the Wealthy College Business Leadership Council, um, where we had the pleasure to meet in the fall, and the current president-elect of the Alumni Association, so we thank her for presenting this panel today. Good afternoon, my name is Linda Zizalio. It's my honor to introduce Ms. Jenny Brendamel. Jenny leads the Global Human Resources team as Chief People Officer at Czech. She and her team helped the company go public in 2013 and scaled Czech's talent and culture to become the leading direct-to-student digital learning company in the US. Jenny has years of experience in talent management and organizational development at JDS Uniface, GAP, and Hewlett Packard. At HP, she co-led the Work Innovation Network, which diffused high-performing organizational practices throughout HP globally. Her work was studied and published by UCLA and the state of California. From 2001 to 6, Jenny served on the board of directors for Women's Initiative for Self-Employment, WISE, an Oakland-based nonprofit that empowered low-income women to become entrepreneurs. From 2014 to 17, Jenny served in the Wellesley College Business Leadership Board as co-chair of the membership committee. She earned her BA from Wellesley College and an MHROD, Master of Human Resources and Organizational Development degree from the University of San Francisco. Jenny enjoys skiing, Italian vacations, and keeping up <laughs> with her very active husband and two sons, one who is in college, and another who just joined the working world. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Angelina Lee, and I want to welcome our last panelist, um, Ms. Rudina Cassari, um, who I think exemplifies Wellesley's rich tradition of leadership in the field of venture capital. In a world where fewer than 7% of partners at leading venture firms are women, Rudina has shattered expectations as the founder and managing partner at Glasswing Ventures, a majority women-led VC firm focused on groundbreaking AI technology and on driving positive change for women in artificial intelligence and uh, venture capital. Um, I think among her many impressive accolades, Rudina has served as entrepreneur in residence at the Harvard Business School for four consecutive years, as well as as the executive in residence at Harvard's Innovation Lab. She graduated magna cum laude from Wellesley College with a BA in Economics and International Relations, as well as with an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Please join me in welcoming Rudina and our three fantastic Wellesley siblings back to the Albright Institute. So it's great to be back. Um, a number of years ago, I'm not going to do the math because it gets depressing, I was a student and I used to actually like to study right here in the library. They used to have these great little cubicles I would study in. 
And one of my friends came by, it was our first year, and I was just getting to know her. And as we all know, one of the greatest things about this place is the fact that you meet people who have a totally different perspective from yours, and you have this amazing opportunity for a number of years to have dialogue and to challenge each other and to think and contemplate what that might mean for you and your perspectives. So she did just that. Um, I came from the Midwest, you heard, that's where I live now again, that's where I grew up. Um, came to Wellesley from a public high school, had no idea what I wanted to be when I grew up, had no idea. But I was studying away and she came in my little study cubicle one day and she said, and she was from Vermont, um, she said, you're going to go into business, aren't you? And I said, oh, I don't know. Um, I really don't know what I'm going to do. And she said, well, business is bad. And I said, oh, well, that's quite a definitive statement. <laughs> and I frankly was not prepared at all to either defend or agree. I, I didn't know enough. So that's how it started. And as you heard, I did end up in business. Um, she ended up as a lawyer in the entertainment industry. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's fine. I mean, I'm just, just, just following through on the story. Um, so my point is everyone probably has some impression of for-profit businesses, right? Businesses that, are, that do make money or attempt to make money. They don't all make money, but are attempting to make money. So the way I want to start today is just get some of your impressions of for-profit businesses. I'd imagine some of you have worked for some. I'd imagine some of your parents or aunts and uncles or siblings um, have experience in working at big companies, small companies, but you know, not, a, not a company that's only doing something charitable or philanthropic. So, um, so to start, I'm going to put a few things on the board here, just a few of your impressions, if you will, of um, a for-profit business. So well, this will, we want to go real quick because I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, but Throw, throw a few out. Go ahead. Makes money, but where does it go? No reinvestment. <laughs> no reinvestment. Okay. Oh, that's not a good one. Hang on. I had one before that was good. Makes money, but no reinvestment. Okay. Who else? I saw a hand over here. Um, it destroys small and local businesses. Destroys small local business. Okay. Who's got it right here? Lack of communication between lower level employees and business um, employees. Lack of communication with employees. Okay, good. Um, with the top elite, the CEO, et cetera, et cetera, it takes like this proportionally large salary. Uh-huh. See, we'll call that uh, executive compensation is the buzzword for that. <laughs> okay. Jenny's gearing up over there. These are all her favorite topics. Okay. She's getting warmed up. Yeah. Um, serves customers who can pay and ignores the ones who can. Only serves customers who pay. Okay. Okay, where else? Right here. I actually think of the freedom for innovation and strong economic opportunity, especially at small business owners' levels. Freedom to innovate, and what was the other part? Um, strong economic opportunity, especially um, within small businesses. Strong economic opportunity, good, I like that. I like all the other ones too, for the purposes of our discussion, just to be clear, right there. Exploit vulnerable populations. Exploit vulnerable populations. Okay. Okay. Uh, sometimes the profit can allow for investment in research. Uh huh. Okay. So profit leads to research and development. We call that R and D. Back in. Uh, puts profit ahead of public goods, such as the environment. Profit, okay, profit is more important than the public good. I'm using a little few abbreviations here just so I can go quickly. 
right here. Uh, sometimes bring uh, more opportunity to areas where there isn't, where there aren't many opportunities. So brings economic development to communities. Is that, am I capturing that correctly? Okay. I don't want to change your words. Um, brings economic development to a certain community, right? All right, a couple more here, yeah. Uh, the competition increases uh, efficiency and also uh, advancement in just general, like uh, technology. Uh-huh, so there could be some technology advancement. Good, okay. Poor condition for low-level employees. Say it again. Poor conditions, poor working conditions. Okay. If they can buy out competition and become a monopoly. Monopoly, yeah, we got potential for monopoly. Sometimes treat uh, corporate social responsibility as part of their branding strategy. Uh-huh, corporate social responsibility, otherwise abbreviated as CSR, as part of their branding. Right, so you're saying when they sell you something, they're saying if you buy this, we're gonna like Tom shoes, right? We're gonna donate some for shoes. Okay, good. Uh, any others? So I think the flip side of bringing up economic development is like if it leaves the community, it can really destroy that community. Mm-hmm. Business economic. I'm gonna call that the plus and the minus. Coming and going. Good. Good point. Any others to get us rolling? You got another one. Yeah, if they do care about social responsibility, it's only because they can make money from it. Social responsibility only to make money. Okay. They attract customers who care about social responsibility. Okay. We're getting a good list, aren't we? <laughs> this is going to be fun, isn't this? Yeah. All right. They're fired up. Okay. This is gonna, and it's Friday afternoon. I mean, come on. Let's have some fun, right? Oh, I should have stated up front, too. This is not meant to be a lecture by any means. This is meant we're going to have a dialogue here, okay? So hopefully it, it keeps everybody awake. I know it's the end of a long week. All right. There were one or two more here. Yeah. Um, there are sometimes links with politics. Um, mm -hmm. Ah, okay. Okay. Politics, political links and corruption. All right. Anyone dying to give one more? Or I think we got a pretty good list working here. There's one more. Maybe like investment in like fossil fuels or prisons, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> Say a little more about that. Investing in <laughs> fossil fuels and prisons. Like money, money and things that we see like as immoral or unethical to like make money off of that investment. Oh, I see. OK, what's that? The commerce would be divestment. Right? Yeah. Okay. Investing and supporting bad things <laughs> to abbreviate. Okay. So very helpful for us to get a little perspective as to where your heads are. Um, we're going to spend a little time in this session to do a couple things. We're going to talk about a number of companies sort of as case studies. We got two experts here along with me who are going to give you some examples of things they've seen. We also are going to share a little bit about our path. Um, our career path because um, for many of you whether it's really soon in the spring or next fall or the next year um, You'll all be faced with trying to figure that all out So we're going to provide hopefully a couple insights on that along the way um, And we're going to try to make a couple arguments about our viewpoint on as you can see um, that for-profit business um, May or may not um, do all those things and maybe does some other things, okay? So that's what we want you to consider. So um, just to get us rolling, um, after my friend uh, and I had that early discussion in the library, um, as it so turned out, I did end up in business, right? Mostly because when I graduated Wellesley, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I went through at the time what was the traditional sort of recruiting here, which means a lot of investment banking and consulting. Um, investment banking sounded interesting. And then my sister, who was living in New York, said, you know, they drive you home in a limousine, which is really cool. But after they do that night after night after night at 3 in the morning, and then you have to be back at the office at 6, the excitement wears off. So, and I think we have a former investment banker here, so Radina can talk about that excitement too. So I went to management consulting here in Boston at Bain & Company, thinking I could get exposed to a number of different businesses and then kind of figure out what I like and don't like, because I still didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Okay. Um, well, 14 months after I graduated, 
was this thing called a recession. Now, luckily, you all know what a recession is because you lived through one in 2008 and 9. But this is back in 1990. So with that recession, they had hired 70 of us out of undergrad that year. They hired these big groups each year. They got rid of 50 of us, just like that. So one of the first life lessons I learned very young is you always want to be marketable because you just don't know when that's going to happen to you. Things happen in your life that are totally out of your control, right? Companies get bought and sold every day. You could have a new boss. They have a different idea how they want to do things. A different companies can take a different approach. Any organization, right? Doesn't have to be in a for-profit. Um, but you always want to be marketable. So I headed back to the Midwest, where I'm from, and decided to just flood the Minneapolis-St. Paul market with my resume, hoping to get a job. And I was starting to think business school is a good idea. And so that's what I did. And two days before, a company called General Mills gave me an offer. This company called Medtronic gave me an offer. So I took it, not really knowing what Medtronic was or what they did. But I thought, I can go work here for a year or so. And then I can get out of here, go back to business school. Then I'll figure out what I want to be when I grow up. So I went to this place. It was just before we were at a billion dollars in sales. Um, but what gets really interesting is that, um, well, let me, I'm going to pause there. And then I'm going to come back to Medtronic. Because I want to turn it now to Jenny and Rudina and just let them give you a brief overview of how they went from Wellesley into the for-profit world. So um, I was a psychology major at Wellesley. Loved it. Um, fantastic professors here, Robin Aker, Jonathan Cheek. I uh, thought I was going to go into research um, and also be in private practice. And what happened was um, in my junior year, I went into the Urban the Politics internship. At that time, it was uh, two programs, one in D.C. and one in San Francisco. Typically, it was in L.A., but coincidentally, that year they had it in San Francisco. I worked for the city of San Francisco mental health services. So I worked out of two clinics, uh, one in the Mission, which is a, uh, predominantly Hispanic, and the other one in uh, off the Castro. Um, great experience. However, what was interesting was there was one day when a number of counselors and psychologists and I had to take patients to the Haight-Ashbury area to go bowling. And uh, I don't know, this, if you've read much about San Francisco back in the 60s, this was in the 80s, so these were all former hippies. Uh, it's the hate, right? And um, we took them bowling, and the scary thing for me at the time, and this is not to you know, say anything negative about the counseling profession, I couldn't tell the difference between the counselors and the patients. And I thought, huh, okay, well this is interesting. I think maybe I wanna work with what might be more on the normal side of the range. <laughs> and uh, by the way, by the time I got into business, I realized that PhD would have come in handy <laughs> because the definition of normal in most organizations was much broader than I had realized. Uh, and when people need help, they just go get an executive coach. Uh, so um, anyway, so back to the story about psychology. Uh, so I thought, huh, you know, I think before I commit to a PhD program, I really think I should work. In my senior year at Wellesley, I had taken a really fascinating course called Organizational in, in Industrial Psychology. So I thought, wow, I think I'm really going to try to think about a job in human resources, but I think I don't want to go work for a company that has unions because I think it would just be more flexible. We could, I could learn a lot more. Um, at that time, tech was just starting to rise. This was sort of before the digital age. And I took a job with a small semiconductor, a computer chip company in New York and um, met my husband there, by the way, and uh, learned a lot. It was a small company of about 600 people. And over time, um, you know, I decided I wanted to move to the West Coast. So my husband, who I then married, right, at that point, moved to the West Coast. First job was with National Semiconductor. They were one of the cowboys in the early days of Silicon Valley. The story there, the famous story, was that when they had no money and couldn't pay for landscaping services, they basically bought a bunch of goats and tied them all around the lawns to eat the grass. Um, but after nine months and a, a layoff later, I realized that it really wasn't the kind of environment I wanted to work in. And my very wise husband, who's an old soul, said to me, um, you know, maybe it would make sense to go work for just a better company. And so this is my advice to you. Look for the culture in terms of any place you work. 
whether it's a nonprofit foundation, NGO, for profit, that matter, it, it trumps everything else in terms of whether you're going to find it meaningful and a good fit for you and your personality and what you want to do. Um, because at that point, I said, I'm dumping HR. I'm going to go into something else. I could have just as easily gone into management consulting and all those other areas that Martha had mentioned. Um, so at that point, I decided to leave. I had two job offers at HP. I also talked to Apple. Apple had the more glamorous opportunities. HP had a better opportunity to learn um, because it really had a value around teaching their employees at all levels. And so I took the HP job um, and I ended up spending 10 years there and having five jobs in 10 years because there was always something very interesting to do at HP. Um, and then the rest is history. I pretty much continued to look for companies that were a good fit from a culture perspective and where I could learn the most. And by the way, on the investment banking story, um, you said it was the thing to do back then. It was because I was class 85 and we had the Wall Street warm up and all this stuff where we, uh, you know, they, they took students to Wall Street to check out jobs and to understand careers. I went to uh, a panel with uh, Wellesley alums who had gone into investment banking. And I just remembered this one woman kept talking about how fascinating the sausage skin industry was. <laughs> And I just couldn't, I just couldn't get excited. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted something a little more meaningful. And I do want to say, I, I really am someone who values doing work that helps others, right? And that just wasn't going to do it. And for those who didn't know, HP stands for Hewlett Packard. So back Thank in you. the computer yes. world. All right, Radina will share her journey into the for-profit world. <clears throat> So my, um, my journey did start with um, investment banking, but while at Wellesley, um, as previously mentioned, I studied international relations and economics. So I was somewhere in the, I had a soul, but I was interested in business as well. Um, <laughs> in fact, I think uh, one of my favorite moments sort of, when I talk about Wellesley to others, I will say I'm Albanian originally, and there are plenty of internationals here. And, you know, we all have our own experiences of what defines us. And my defining moment for sure was Wellesley, more so than any of my later experiences. And when I try to give an example of how so, um, I think it was the January session of my senior year for the seniors in this room. Um, I had decided there was a peace and justice program to go to India for a month with Mahatma Gandhi's great grandson. And I was a financial aid student and I said, I want to do it. And the money showed up. So that was Wellesley and that's sort of how Wellesley enabled me. Um, but I was an international student, and so when you're an international student, um, as you deal with visas and other limitations, some of the more formal programs are better for you. And you better believe it, consulting and investment banking were more formal programs. So I went down the banking route, mastered the interviewing, thank you, Joanne, <laughs> uh, ended up somehow miraculously with seven offers. And the hot thing when I graduated was tech. I couldn't spell tech, I had taken one computer science class back there, and that was about it, a JavaScript class and um, HTML basics, and that was that. So I ended up, though, going in the tech group at what was called at the time Credit Suisse First Boston, CS Today, um, with a, working in a very, led by a very famous banker, Frank Watron. I joined, and you'll see some repetitions in themes here, and in 2000, there was a bubble burst in 2001. This group went from being 700 people within a much, much bigger, you know, multi-thousand people investment bank. And I was there for three years, survived six rounds of layoffs. The group went from 600 people to 100 people and ended up being a witness for this gentleman. Um, so it's a fascinating story when you're 20-some and you're dealing with, oh gosh, if they let me go, I have 60 days to leave the country with... Uh, learning the value of hard work to, uh, who is Elliot Spitzer again? <laughs> he was Attorney General of the state of New York at the time. Um, that experience was uh, just perfect for me to start thinking about um, what was next. And much like Martha, I, I applied for business school and got into the Harvard Business School for my MBA, but I had caught the tech bug. Um, I worked on the JD Uniface pump spin out. 
I worked for Nortel. I studied a lot of the cool sort of transactions, covered semiconductors as well, so we can talk lots. Yeah, I didn't um, know that, Redina. So, um, so from from that perspective, it was very exciting. It was fast paced, and we'll come back to this um, theme. I think I suspect at some point it made a difference. You could see impact, and you could see it in very short order. Um, from business school, I went on to Microsoft for a summer. And then um, from there, was at Microsoft for about two years. I had met um, one of my, what became a partner, um, while at business school in venture capital, had done a project, had remained in contact. And so I became a venture capitalist two years into my um, Microsoft experience, came back to Boston, was with that firm for nine years, made partner. And then in the spirit of risk taking about two years ago, launched my own firm and have seven boards now and all that. So we can talk more about that. Good, thank you. So um, a couple different paths as you see, but I think the common theme is what you heard the two of them say and that, and that it took me maybe longer to figure out, right, than some. Um, but when I, so if go back to my story for a minute, when I got to Medtronic, again, I didn't know much about it. I was looking for a job for about a year and a half and then figured I'd come flying back uh, somewhere else for business school. Um, I had met some guy too, and so was trying to figure out he was in Boston, so how do I get back to Boston? Um, and, and by the way, that's a theme, right? I, I'd imagine the vast majority of you will end up in dual career situations, okay? So this is how life goes. We'll talk about this more at the end, but, um, but it's, something, it's something to think about, because um, anyway, we'll come back to that. So this is a Medtronic mission statement. And like many startup companies, this was a company that started in a garage, okay? And then one day the company you know, grows a little bit, getting some momentum, and then they need some more money, right? So this is how a lot of companies get going. Now they need more money, so they go to the bank and say, we'd like a loan. The bank says, well, what's your company all about? Uh, we do some medical repair, we're kind of working on this, we're thinking about that, no go. So they get, the founder went home and with the help of one other guy wrote this mission statement. Now, I'm not gonna make you read through the whole thing. Here's what's really interesting though. The first thing they say is contributing to human welfare, okay? Um, and then it talks about bioengineering, okay, good. Um, then this is the other really interesting part, to make a fair profit, okay? Focusing on the word fair profit. I didn't see maximize profit up there, right? I didn't see profit over the public good. I didn't see uh, makes money with no reinvestment, right? So what they're saying is we're not here solely to make money, okay? Yes, we need to make a fair profit, and then actually they're gonna reinvest it um, to do a sustained growth and reach goals, but that is not the overriding purpose, okay? So, um, I'm going to do a two-minute sort of diversion just so we can have more of a discussion around what I call shareholder value beliefs and stakeholder value, okay? But just to kind of level set, um, there's, there's basically two kinds of companies out there, right? Um, there's public companies, there's private companies. So if you go down to the corner, as you maybe did as a kid, and start a lemonade stand, that's a private company. You probably borrowed some money from one of your parents, said, go buy, could you buy me some lemons and some, you know, and maybe you made ice, whatever and then you sell your lemonade. Okay, that's a private company, all right? What Rodina does, she invests in private companies, okay? At some point though, if you start to grow and you get really big, you need more money, okay? Now you can ask your family and your friends to, to give you money. You can charge up on your credit cards, maybe. Has anyone here started a company? Is there anyone in the room who started a company? Okay, so you could charge up on your credit cards. If you have a house, you can take out a second mortgage. There's lots of ways to get extra money that you can put into your business. Okay, but at some point, um, you may need even more money. And so then what you do is go to the capital markets. Okay, so for the econ majors have probably seen some of this before, right? But now you can go public, right? Which means you're gonna have other people own your company who you may not know. They're called shareholders, right? And so for those of us on the other side of that equation, I can go to the stock market today, I can take $100, right? And buy a share of stock of some company that's trading at $100 today right? Now I'm an owner, okay? So now I own part of a public company, right? They've issued stock, but it also means I get a vote in terms of what goes on there, okay? And so shareholders now have a little more, have a little more say in what goes on. 
And then once you're a public company, and Jenny can talk all about this because she was with Chegg when it was private and then became public. And now every quarter, Jenny and the senior team at Chegg have to tell all of their shareholders very publicly and the people, particularly on Wall Street, who follow what they're doing, she, they have to share how we're doing because all these people own shares. By right? the way, Marta, if I may interject, Please. it's the case for private companies exactly with two very distinct differences, which is the shareholders are much more concentrated, a couple, people like myself, and you're not hanging the dirty laundry out in the public as the public companies do. So <laughs> unless you're owning the company yourself, if you've taken anybody's money whatsoever, you have shareholders in the company that you have some level of yeah. responsibility to. Great point. And But here again, like you see on the private side, a little less scrutiny, right? Correct. That's to Radina's point. You don't have to air the dirty laundry, right? If you... If, you know, if the sales go down a little this quarter, a public company has to tell you that, right? If they don't tell you that, they're going to end up in orange, okay, by the Securities and Exchange Commission, at least in this country. So, um, so that's a little bit of the difference between public and private. Pause for any questions or comments on that. Okay, so um, then you get into this discussion. Um, so now you're a shareholder, right? So now I own a share of stock. Let's say... Um, Okay, I'm from Minnesota. I'm going to pick Target, right? How many of you have heard of Target? Have you ever gone shopping at Target? Good. It's a good Minnesota company. So now you have a share of Target stock, okay? I'm walking around with a share of Target stock. Um, what do I want to happen with my share of stock, do you think? I paid 100 bucks. I don't even know where Target's trading, but I'm going to make up numbers. I paid 100 bucks. I am a shareholder now. What do I want to happen in the next couple years? I want it to go up. I want to make money, right? Okay, I'm a shareholder. I gave you $100, Target. You can invest it however you see fit. You can, you can do more marketing. You can hire more people. But I am going to expect a return on my investment, right? Because I'm a shareholder. So is that all Target has to worry about? No? What else should they worry about? Anyone? Some people are shaking their head no. Is there anything else to target the senior management team, those, that exec, the people in the executive suite on the cushy carpet? What should they be worrying about? <laughs> hmm. Nothing else. Good. All right. So shareholder, let's just make money and be done. I'm good. I think we're going to end class early. Are we done? Go ahead. Um, I think Target would have to be worried about, number one, if, they're like, if they're share, like, people would lose faith in purchasing their stocks. Mm -hmm. So keeping the psychology, which I think is like having a psych major, I think is really important in business. <laughs> um, I think it's incredibly important. Yeah. Um, so keeping that faith up there with your, with your investors. Okay. Um, so trying to keep the morale of the company really high, um, keeping the, like other factors that would dip the company um, economically, keeping those high. Yep. Okay. Good. Yeah, they should worry about that because I want my money back. Right. All right. I'm going to fast forward for a second here. How many of you have heard of Google? Okay. You all heard of Google. Um, if you go work at Google, what do they do for you? Someone here I know interned at Google. I was looking through the bios last night. What are some of the things when you, what's it, what's it like when you work at Google? Uh, you get free food. Free food. Yeah. What else? You can hang out in a swing. You can play pool, right? You can go down the slide. You can sit in the sun, right? It's a good gig. You don't ever have to go home. You don't even have to go home. Okay, just but so let me ask you a question. If the idea is to just make money, okay, and, and if I own a share of Google stock, and, they, and all I want is my return on my money from, from owning Google stock, and they're giving free food out to their employees, then that's money that could have come to me, the shareholder, right? So now I'm not happy, right? Hmm, okay, I'm seeing some nods yes, I'm seeing some nods no. So should, is Google worrying about anyone other than the shareholder? Well, you just told me they are because they obviously want to feed their employees. Oh, so employees is a group they're worried about. Is there anyone else they're worried about? Um, I had employees. You had employees. <laughs> anyone else in the back? The customers. customers. Yeah, they're worried about customers. Who, what else? Any other stakeholders out there? Competition. They do have to worry about competition. That's correct. Are there any other groups out there? Yep. They might want to consider government because oftentimes there's government grants. Correct. 
Correct. Governance and governments another major stakeholder in healthcare. When you run a, a hospital, most hospitals outside the U.S. are run by the government. So if you're in the business I'm in, we're always dealing with governments. Interest groups such as gender equality, they ran into some trouble with that last summer. Ran into trouble with? Interest groups such as like... Oh, interest groups. Gender equality. Yes. Like that's correct. And that comes more under the employee category, but that's right. Are there any other groups? The product. So where, I mean, so if you have Google products, where are those made? And where does Google make all that themselves? Do they have, we call them suppliers, right? That maybe send the components of the companies in. Okay. Do we care what they're out there doing? Maybe the suppliers out there polluting somewhere. Does Google care? Maybe they should. Right. Exactly. I heard they should somewhere. Go ahead. Probably media. Media. Another stakeholder, right? Because that's going to impact their brand and how they can do. So what, what I'm trying to get at here is that there are a whole bunch of other stakeholders out there, right? I think we covered most of them, the employees, the community, government, customers, suppliers, the environment, and shareholders. So the question is, how many of you have heard of this economist named Milton Friedman? <laughs> right. So Milton Friedman argued very vehemently that the only thing a company should worry about is shareholders. And that if you want to be a good guy, so to speak, or if you want to be philanthropic, you Make all your money, give it back to the shareholders, and then the shareholders can say, oh, I'd like to donate to that nice little charity over there, right? That's the belief. What I think you're going to hear from the three of us is that we tend to subscribe more to the stakeholder approach, which is, and my whole point is, using Google as a good example, um, Google went public in 2003 or four, initial price of about $85. I'm going to round to 100 because I can't do difficult math. I will tell you that if you bought a share of Google at $100, it's now worth $2,200, OK? So that little 100 bucks, if you'd invested back in 2003 or four, four, four thank you, Rodina, 2004, <laughs> today is worth 2200 OK? So the question is, is Google taking care of its employees? It seems like it. You get all that free food and massages and bring your dog to work and the whole deal, right? <laughs> They're doing that. Um, our customers, I'm pretty happy when I do a Google search. I tend to find what I need. So I'm a happy customer. I don't know if you all are. And you go on down the list, OK? So Google has this um, 10 things they believe to be true. And actually, when they went public initially, you have to put in a big filing, OK, with the Securities and Exchange Commission. It said, they said, the first thing they said is do no evil, OK? Now, here's where it gets really interesting. So. I'm going to argue this is a case study in, in for sort of two different things. I think it's really interesting because I think certainly in the initial chapters of the Google life, and then I'm going to turn it over to my experts here, but in the initial chapters of the Google life, they subscribed very much to these things, the 10 things Google believes to be true. And as they said, they initially said, we are going to do no evil out there. OK? So now what's getting interesting is as they get bigger, and as there is some competition, and as there's you know, the way things kind of ebb and flow in the world, not everybody thinks Google is quite the company it maybe used to be, and maybe not living up to all those things as much as they thought. So I'm going to pause there, see if there's any questions or comments from Rudina and Jenny on, uh, on Google. Jenny lives in the thick of Google. So. I, I'm three miles away. Uh, so I live in we, what we call Google Land, and I always see uh, their self-driving cars are always being tested on our streets. It's like a little <laughs> pod cart, something like out of some science fiction movie. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I think a lot of companies, um, especially on the social media internet side, um, start out with good intentions, and because the technology is so disruptive, um, it's had a lot of unintended consequences that I think the founders or the executives of the company never would have guessed, right? I think Facebook is another good example. If you've read kind of in the media now, some of the uh, self-corrective uh, actions that they're taking. Um, but I do think that this is always kind of a requirement to kind of go back to what the core values of a company are um, to say. And I think that's what 
Mark Zuckerberg's done with Facebook, right? It's the social network. And, um, you know, now it's become not realizing that as much as you can now in, in a, amazing ways connect like-minded people together for good, you can also have people connect for evil, right, or for bad things to happen. Um, and so I think those are uh, just making sure that there's leadership that is continually uh, self-checking back to the core values and the core mission of the company. Um, and I think this is true of any company where there's just massive disruption going on around the technology. So so this quote is from one of the founders of Google. I can't tell you exactly when he said this, um, but it is an interesting company to follow because some people started to argue when Google started to be so successful, for example, it drove housing prices way up, That's right? right. That's in, right. In where you lived. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, Someone brought it up, what's that mean for the community? So what, what does that mean for a lower income person in, in the area who wants to have affordable housing? Well, Google's just driven the prices up. Yeah. Well, on the other hand, Google's brought a lot of jobs to people. So that's a sort of economic plus, yeah. right? Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is there's no easy answers here. So the good news is we just get to ask all the hard questions. Yeah. But there really is not an easy answer here. And some would argue, you know, Google and Facebook are going through challenges when they're trying to operate in other parts of the world, mm -hmm. right? right? Where other governments are starting to ask them questions right. about how they do business and privacy and all these other factors that they need to think about. Yeah, and I think there's a balance also of uh, partnership with government, yeah. local governments, to figure out an optimal solution. So if we just sort of zero in a little bit about the issue around traffic and housing costs in the Bay Area right now, um, you know, I think that the infrastructure isn't there and there's a lot of talk about how are they going to figure it out. A lot of companies in that same situation, Silicon Valley right now, because it's collectively, it's not just Google, it's Intel, it's Apple, um, all in a highly concentrated peninsula. Um, and so that's where it, it's going to have to take some pretty out-of-box thinking. And until then, I think companies are also thinking about locating talent elsewhere, right? Not becoming too dependent. But it is a constant partnership with local government to sort this out. And there are no easy answers. And I think that's another good theme, right? I mean, I think all the issues you're all spending time thinking about in this institute are, you know, there often are public-private partnerships that really should be happening because chances are one can't or won't solve it alone. So I think this is a great example. Do you have any other comments? Yeah, so I think I'll make two, two points. One, um, if you go back to the root of how a lot of these companies get started, and again, I see that the ground level of two or three founders with an idea, unshowered for a few days, you know, and that whole passion. Um, you will be surprised the first motivator is not to make money. It's down the list. It's to create something cool. It's to be impactful. It's to make a difference. It would be worse descriptors and, honestly, emotions that are not too, too different from others who go across the world to improve the lives of others in a social or policy or non-for-profit setting. And I think that often gets lost. As these companies gain traction, then the motivations, the dynamics, the management becomes much more complex, as both Martha and Jenny have highlighted. The other piece that I think I want to kind of almost bring us back to the beginning is the fact if there's a lot of in the comments that if you know if you weigh them, there's a lot more concern. I won't call them negative, but there's more a lot of concern than optimism around the role of business. So it might be a worthy exercise, even if it's for a second, as we think about how we drive change for good, how we improve um, the environment, our society, equality, diversity, all things that are core to a better society at a global level. Um, what if we had a world without business? How exactly would it operate? And how exactly would we eat? So um, where would the clothes on our bodies come from? So. How do these two forces exist? Is policy just all bad? Let me take the other extreme, none of which believe in. Policy is terrible. I'm, and again, I'm taking the extreme. It's not a belief. I'm going to make the provocative statement. Public policy and non-for-profit is just goofy and terrible for people who don't want to do real work and create real value or products because, you know, you just talk all day and imagine a world that's not real. 
How do you feel about that? That's not true. How do you feel about somebody taking the position evil, uh, you know, business is evil because all we do is care about money? That's also not true. They're interlinked and they often start from a common passion for good. So how can the two intertwine is a question that we deal with and that I deal with as an investor every day as I try to maximize for, I take your parents' pension money. So think about what I do. The two tying in together. If, can I spend one Please. minute? Um, I take your parents' pension money, literally. It goes into a fund. I and people like me, pension money, endow university endowments like Wellesley and others. So money that goes to run this university, this college that runs for financial aid and all sorts of other allocations and gets pulled into a fund like mine or hundreds of others. Those dollars get invested into, into these startups the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Ubers of the world, they become very valuable. I take ownership when they go public, as Martha laid the groundwork of understanding there, I get what is called a return, which is, if successful, many fold bigger than what I'd invested. That return, I certainly evil owe capitalists take a profit, but it goes back into the pension funds and into the endowments many, many times you know, bigger so that the retirees can live better. Am I evil? I optimize for profits, but am I evil? So it's a lot more complicated and intertwined than one would think, and I'll pause there. Yeah, I was going to offer uh, another perspective, and that's interesting, Rudina, from the investing side, right? I think on the, the, the company side, um, especially since I'm on the consumer internet side of the world, um, all of you and other consumers don't want to buy from companies that don't care about sustainability, that don't care about uh, doing good. And so it's almost become an imperative now, I think, if you're starting up a company, especially as it relates to consumers, because people can choose if they're going to buy at Target or Walmart right, based on their perception of those companies. And so, uh, you know, fellow alumni, Vicky uh, Sai, who right. runs Tatcha, so it's a skincare company in San Francisco, what you're seeing more and more now is that startups and small companies, and her business is private, she's been at it for eight years, and she's been one of the fastest growing companies on, in Inc. Magazine, top 50, is that she's already built into her model that a certain percentage of her revenue is going to go to uh, Room to Read, which is a nonprofit organization that funds women's education in developing countries. And so that sort of thing you didn't used to see, especially in the era that Martha and I went to work in, um, but you see it in droves now. And I think there are so many entrepreneurs who I would call social entrepreneurs too, and that's a whole other topic. Well, I think it's a great point, and it's just one other quote for you up here, right? And, and Jenny used to work for Hewlett Packard, as she said. And so I think, you know, there have been some leaders out there, and, and David Packard being one of them, um, and, and Larry Page with Google, at least initially. And I think, as you said, you're hearing about more and more now. But even way back, there were some in the Milton Friedman days of shareholder value only who were saying, no, 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 that's wrong. In fact, can you yeah, share that yeah. little tidbit there's a, about There's a great story yeah. about Dave Packard. I was at HP when he was still alive as a founder, but not CEO. Um, when he was 29 or 28 years old, uh, he was a Stanford grad. He went to a Stanford conference on business, and a professor had said, it is all about uh, shareholder value. That is the single most important thing that you got to care about when you're running a company. And he was really courageous. He stood up and he said, you know what, I absolutely disagree with you because it's also about employees, it's about our partners and our suppliers. And he went on to really found this company called Hewlett Packard. And one of the early values of the company that continued, at least until I was there, and then it did change, uh, the world changes, um, was a very egalitarian set of values. Employees in the company had profit sharing that they got paid twice a year, everybody got the same amount respective of your position level. I think somebody said here earlier about not treating lower level employees well, as well as uh, senior leaders. Um, that wasn't Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett, and they were early pioneers in this. They were the first to have open offices without private offices. Um, executives did not have private parking spots or private cafes. Uh, he really believed in that, and he believed that the mission of the company was to contribute to society as uh, as was mentioned earlier. 
So they started out that way, they, but you have to be able to afford it too. So I just wanted to talk about the practical realities the way Rudina <laughs> described it is the more you can make the money you need to reinvest, right? Whether it's in your product or with your employees, the better. And I think in when we think about it currently, for example, I'll just throw out a few dilemmas. If you're in a digital business where 100% of your revenue is coming from advertising, you're going to potentially run into the issues of that dilemma in terms of how do you balance shareholders with your, your stakeholders, right? When you think about employees, because it will be, especially when you're public, on that quarterly march to show profit and to grow. Um, the other thing is, so, so you explain that. I'm not sure. Explain yeah. that. Did everyone follow this advertising thing? I mean, because I think the, the sort of big dilemma there yeah. is, are you willing to sell? I mean, Jenny works for an education technology company, right? So if they let people pay for ads on their site, you know, how would you feel if there were cigarette yeah. companies advertising, let's just for an extreme yeah. example? I mean, the whole advertising topic, I think, is a very interesting kind of ethical um, as well as for good question, right? So at Chegg, for example, how many of you have heard of Chegg? Can you just survey? <laughs> yeah, because college students are our audience, right? As, <laughs> as well as high school, as I expected. Um, so we feel very strongly, for example, we have a, a range of products, right? As some of you know, we've got everything from Chegg Study, which is online STEM homework help, um, all the way to video tutoring, um, test prep, and other prod oh, writing tools. Um, in Chegg Study, because it's an academic support tool, we absolutely do not want advertising when you're using the product. We might sometimes do promotions and things like that if you're not a subscriber, because it is a subscriber business. The other thing I would also say is that advertising is not our main revenue source. And so we're selling product and service based on the value and wanting to keep it affordable compared to what you would have to pay for a face-to-face one-on-one tutoring session, um, or if you had to go get homework help in terms of any of the STEM, STEM subjects. So our mission in itself, I think, is really about doing good. It's really creating, an, um, creating access to digital support tools for education that you couldn't normally get on campus, which is on demand 24 by seven, right? Which is, we're in the age of Uber and Netflix and all these ways that you can get things now. And we're also finding majority of students work. Um, you know, it may or may not be the case for many of you here at Wellesley, but those a lot of the state schools, we've got a big percentage of students that are working part-time. They can't get to their campus tutoring center or the budget's been cut. Um, but advertising is very interesting because that can create some interesting dilemmas for company. Help. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah, and I will give another sort of um, side of of the coin, but, but very analogous to what Jenny was just saying. In in startup land, um, before they get to be Google, before they get to be Chegg, they're the guys who go quarter to quarter, right, every three months, wondering if they will actually be able to survive. So it's you know whether it's an advertising model or some other model, is the difference. The challenge is the difference between. Um, you know, do you go f a down a certain path to generate money, generate revenue, or do you f shut your doors? Um, and sometimes that means making difficult decisions between prioritizing your stakeholders. For example, you might have to lay off some people to be able to uh, continue to ride the situation and then be able to build again. Right there in a outside-in world, you have just optimized profits or revenue over your people, over that other set of stakeholders, um, employees who are somebody's mom, somebody's aunt, somebody's um, you know sister or one's own person. Uh, that's one point of view and a very legitimate one. The other point of view is, had that step not been taken, 100% of those employees would be out of a job. At least you have, um, the, the expression is you've lived to fight another day. So it's a constant prioritization of decisions, it's a constant um, struggle of how do you, how do you go forward. Um, it's also the case that the world is changing and it's changing very fast. We are in tech and 
even for us, it is my role, it is my job, my core definition to stay with the curve, the cycle is getting shorter and shorter and the world is getting faster and faster and we need to respond to those. And sometimes those changes happen way faster than our ability to respond at a legislative level, at a norms level, at a society level to match or to, to, act, to, re, to adjust so that there is appropriate um, matches between, between those two. And that's something that I think about a lot. For example, in tech, we don't have a lot of women. In boards, we don't have a lot of women. So I can talk about that at some point now yeah. or, or later. We'd love to talk about that. Can I offer an actual real life il illustration of what Radina just described? When I was at HP uh, in the 90s, we continued to have a no layoff policy. And this was very heartfelt and felt very strongly by Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. And then the company hit some speed bumps, right? It had been 40 years of consecutive growth year over year. Um, and they could afford to provide incredible benefits for employees, right, and to take care of people. At that point, they had 350,000 employees globally. They were 50 billion. They're now over 100 billion. And talk about technology disruption, um, a lot of their businesses all commoditized. So what I mean is then the price drops significantly, your profit margins become a lot lower, and it also got a lot more competitive because they were competing with Dell and everybody else compact in the PC market. This was a 90s story, but a very good example, I think, of the lessons of technology and how that can impact a company that really, really had a huge commitment and unquestionable integrity, I think, about how they wanted to run their business and how they would serve employees and partners all over the world. Um, and so post that period, it's really, it's a different company. I wouldn't even call it the same. Different market pressures, very competitive, um, and layoffs. You know, I'm sure you read in the news all the time, oh, another 20,000 employees are leaving HP. So case in point. And the, the one other example I'd give on that is, is living out right now, right, with Facebook. And so, you know, the, Facebook's been in the news a lot lately. And if you think about what Facebook was initially designed to do and some of the amazing benefits of Facebook, right, you can be connected with people all over the world. You have a specific interest or need or group you want to be a part of. You can do that through Facebook. At the same time, we seem to have learned, right, that terrorists are communicating with each other on Facebook, right? So what is the role that Facebook plays in that? That is a pretty significant dilemma to be thinking about on a very daily basis. So I hope through some of these examples, what you've been able to see is this stuff is not clear cut by any means, right? We all love our Apple phones. Do people know where most of the, pro most of the components for Apple products are made? In lots of other parts of the world, okay? That gets back to the same argument. Well, if the standard working conditions that we all seem to maybe know and believe, or those of us who are American, um, may or may not be the same standard that others consider in another part of the world. And what obligation do you have to either raise up to that same level, while, and how do you respect local and cultural norms while you're doing that, right? Again, a whole set of questions and, and things that you have to think about every day when you're in this world, okay? So if we come back here, I won't go back through the list fully, but what I'd encourage you to do is just kind of take one more hard look at the list we formulated here at the beginning, and our hope is that we've shared with you the idea that, you know, not all business is evil, right? Um, we're, not, we're not all there to, you know, destroy the environment and be mean to employees and not talk to lower level employees and have horrible working conditions. I am not here to say that hasn't happened. That has definitely happened, right? I'm not going to tell you that hasn't. But I believe that for-profit businesses who are led by courageous leaders, and it does take a lot of courage, right? I mean, these are tough, tough decisions. And what do you do when you've said, I have a no layoff policy, but the difference between laying off and not laying off people is whether your company is going to exist or not. Now what do you do, right? What did I do when I went down to the Dominican Republic where I had 1,200 employees and I saw the conditions under which they worked? I went back to corporate and fought like a crazy person to say, we are going to fix that. Did it cost money? Yes. Did I cost my team a bonus that year? Yes. 
Why? Because I said that's an investment we have to make for the long run. My bonus, their bonus was based on a one year thing. We gave it up. We sat as a team and said this is the right thing to do for these people who are working very, very hard for us. So we did it. We put the money in. That means our final numbers didn't look so good. We gave up for that. Those are the tough calls you have to make. Some people are willing to make them, some are not. But we hopefully have been able to argue and, and convey here that you've really got to think about all the stakeholders. And I'm certainly very encouraged because I think as Jenny was talking about too, with, with a lot of the businesses we're seeing out there today, particularly a lot of the businesses that are being started up new, there really is a social component to it, right? They're very much thinking about that, not just how do I make money and then later I'll go, I'll go think about sort of being a good person. But it's really interconnected, and I think that's fabulous progress. And what I'd add to that is I think um, as you think about social change and becoming agents for change, for positive change, that can happen from the outside in through policies, through governance, you know, at the government level and at the policy level and non for profit level. It can happen at the business level inside in with all these examples. And we in our capacities can be um, agents for good. So I'm in a position where in tech we don't have enough diversity. Um, and in particular women, whether they are entrepreneurs who get funded or whether they're in, uh, you know, in, at board levels. Well, um, I'm still focused on generating returns because, again, I've taken your mom's pension and your dad's pension money, so I have to keep that stakeholder. But I, I'm hard-pressed to admit or to allow someone else to convince me that for XYZ role, only men can do it. I went to Wellesley, remember? <laughs> so, um, so I can drive change and bring in more executive women or women in executive roles and at the board level directors who are women. And I do that all the time and I've done that successfully. So think of business and uh, you know your peers and other Wellesley women who go into business as agents for good from the inside in as well as what gets done from the outside. Great segue as we wrap up here. Um, a little bit of sisterly advice, as I call it. Um, just a couple thoughts as, you know, again, in the next year or two, you're all going to be embarking on uh, the big world out there. And a couple things to think about. And I'll let Rudina and Jenny jump in too. Um, and then we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers about anything. We're happy to take questions on career stuff. We're happy to take questions on the shareholder versus stakeholder discussion. Any, anything is uh, pretty wide open. Um, but as you go into your first jobs, you already heard Jenny talk about it, right? Do your due diligence on the, on the organizations you're going to be with. Again, I don't care if you're going to be in a government agency, an NGO, for-profit business, whatever it is. But if you're not starting your own thing, spend a lot of time understanding the culture of the place, right? If there's something that we've learned very recently with all the Me Too going on, right, you really need to do your homework and understand what kind of place you're heading into, okay? Um, Can I just add to that? Most organizations will have stated values. I think the question to ask is, hey, what are the actual values and what do you actually see happening around here? Yeah, there's kind of the written stuff and then there's the norms, right? So right. great question. I'd say meet with as many people as you can and ask them, what's it really like around here? Simple question. Get what's the offer like? first, by the way. Yeah. And then ask the <laughs> but ask the questions. Um, <laughs> I would ask the question before the offer. Okay. <laughs> She's the head of HR. Go with her. <laughs> I think uh, these days people are very open to that question. I do too. Yeah. Um, also, be a great team member. In your first couple jobs, think about who are you working for, not as much what are you working on. Okay. Like if you go to a bigger organization, if, if you go into, you know, if you go to General Mills, it's not whether you're working on Cheerios or yogurt, right? But it's who are the bosses that you're going to be learning from? Because what you want to do is put yourself in positions where you can learn very quickly in your first couple jobs. I can get more excited at Cheerios than sausage skins. There you go. I hear you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, help your boss look good. This is, it seems like basic stuff, but I'm amazed at how many people kind of forget about that, right? It's not all about you right away, right? Um, help, your, help your boss look good. Share the knowledge. People often think in these big organizations, again, this is for-profit, not-for-profit, that if I, have the, if I have the information, then they, they have to rely on me. Wrong, okay? Share, share the information. Um, Use the Wellesley Network, right? The Hive is up and running now. I think this seems like it's going to be a very good thing. I don't know how you're all feeling about it. I'm seeing a few nods. Okay. Um, but 
I can tell you nine and a half times out of 10, when you call a Wellesley alum and ask her for some advice, or if you could meet nine and a half times out of 10, they say yes. Okay. So just do it. Um, and thank you goes a long way. Um, particularly a handwritten thank you note in this day and age in particular, it sends a really extra, you know, extra strong message. Um, and then the only other thing I would add is, you know, life happens, right? We talked earlier about being dual career. Um, you know, I, I remember the day my phone call came about me moving to Switzerland. I had a three year old and a five week old. Um, my husband was in a job um, in, a, in a local bank in Minneapolis and they said, do you want to move to Switzerland? And so here again, because we'd been faced with this before, we have to make a decision. You know, what's he doing? What am I doing? What's the best thing for the family? None of this stuff is simple. Okay, this was once discussed at a Harvard Business School case and someone wanted to try to do a regression analysis on my decision to move to Europe. Okay, <laughs> very interesting. So yeah, so the professor walked up and said, why don't you go put the variables on the board, yeah. right? Yeah, so it doesn't go, right? Because this is life. So it's just not all that easy. And sometimes you just have to say, you know what? It'll be a great adventure. And so guess what? We packed up two little people and my husband and a very American nanny, I have to say. <laughs> And off we went to Switzerland for three years and had an unbelievable experience personally and professionally. So, you know, these things happen, right? If you decide to get married, marry well, just like Sheryl Sandberg said and lean in. Which, and let's define I mean, you well. Say you have a great partner? Could you define well? Well, someone who supports your, your professional career, right? And who's an equal partner with you on the whole topic of childcare. Yeah. Right. And, no, I think that's and right. I just, no, sometimes uh, when people uh, say marry well, it means go for the money. Uh, I just wanted to be yeah, really well, clear. It, it can be that too, well, right? Okay. But, but let's just say that when I had my first baby, um, my husband knew more about diapering than I did because he had a baby sister who was 14 years younger. So when he was in high school, right. he had to do diapers. So, and and I will add on to that, which is to say, I'm at probably that point in my. I have a four and a half year old daughter, and um, my husband has a big job. I have a big job, and it's it used to be automatically assumed that the you know the wife would would be the one to take the second seat. That is, excuse me, that is not assumed. And I've been on the road a lot for the last two years. And dad is the has been the primary interface. And now I'm things have settled down. So I'm stepping up quite a bit. It's a give and take. And it's an important equal relationship. I think it's also when your kids need you. Yeah, right. So, um, you know, in my case, uh, I was more flexible around my schedule when the kids were younger, and I have two boys. Martha and I were sharing notes on that. She's got three boys. Uh, we hope one day my they moms. can all go to Wellesley, but uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes and to, no. They'll go to MIT and come here. There we go. Um, but uh, you know, when my boys were eight and ten, they really needed their dad, right? The same gender role model for them at that time, and so I took the big job at Gap and and did the uh, commute. So, and he dialed back and was a consultant for a few years. So take turns at the right time. 